I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. I uh, got out of, out of the airplane and I just fainted on the on the runway. And I crawled to the airport terminal, leaving everything I had behind. Because I was uh, now, I thought in my mind that I was going to die right there. This is how I felt. It was, it was 92, 93. So everybody was out traveling and we talked about it and it could be great fun. And he started working right after high school and um, to earn money. And it was, a, it was a huge thing. And we planned and planned and planned and did everything. And we thought we were really well prepared. So we went. <laughs> Two weeks before entering Indonesia, we started taking the pills. these thoughts it just became worse and worse in the beginning it was little things like um, there was a spider and it was like huge and I killed it with my sh hiking boot <laughs> uh, and and there was no spider at all I made this hailstorm and this thunderstorm and it was coming from me the thunderstorm was real but it came from me and I could feel it in my whole body and my pores that it was coming out of me. That was, that was scary. I kind of realized something was wrong. As we were waiting for the flight to go to Kathmandu, they took me aside, um, the flight personal. They thought I was on drugs, definitely. So everybody could see it, I think. And they searched me and I had to strip all my clothes and, and they didn't find anything. We didn't take anything. They, were, they wanted to kill me. They wanted to keep me in Nepal, get the money from the insurance. I had all these thoughts. And I was 19 years old and my life was in pieces. I had to reinvent myself. I had to figure out little by little how to, how to get my life going. Welcome to this, our first session on our inquiry into whether the use of the anti-malarial drug Lariam for service personnel is an acceptable risk. I'd like to ask our two witnesses... In 2015, the British Parliament took the unusual step of opening an inquiry into a single drug, mefloquine, also known as larium. It wanted to know if the supposed risks associated with this routinely supplied drug outweighed the benefits of its use as a medicine to prevent malaria, specifically in relation to the British Armed Forces. But what had led to this inquiry, and why was a well-used prescription medicine now approached with such suspicion? reported that mefloquine can cause severe mental this disturbances. This drug called mefloquine is in fact very, very dangerous, which is... I'm referring to the harmful effects of the anti-malarial drug, mefloquine. psychosis, suicide, <laughs> suicidal thoughts and self-endangering behaviour.
This January, my husband uh, saw a program on television telling about mifloquine, and he, he rang me and he said, I sent you a mail, but you better be prepared for this. And um, I opened the mail, and, and there was the story about larium and the new um, scientific proof that there are side effects that are, that are uh, serious. I think 10 days I was on the internet. I heard stories a few years after about people that had experienced similarities with larium, um, but I didn't know. I always thought I, uh, it was something wrong with me. It limited me in so many ways. Um, so I had to live a quiet life. So the history of mefloquine really goes back uh, decades, over 70 years. Uh, the drug we had previously used, quinine or quinine, which is a naturally occurring uh, substance, our supplies of quinine uh, were essentially blocked uh, by the Axis powers in, in World War II. And so anticipating uh, a long campaign in the South Pacific, uh, the U.S. government uh, brought together experts across the scientific community, including here at Johns Hopkins, uh, for what was then really the Manhattan Project of malaria drug uh, development. And one leading uh, class of drug that was investigated for this purpose uh, were the quinolines. All of these drugs had disturbing toxicities associated with their use, and the U.S. military was very aware of one particular property of adabrin, its, its tendency to induce manic confusional psychosis. This was well understood uh, even as World War II was uh, starting. But it was so essential that compliance with this drug be enforced uh, that these properties were deemed a restricted information, the equivalent of uh, secret uh, information. So in the jungle kit there's another bottle and it has Atterburn tablets in it. Malaria tablets to all of us GIs. Take them regularly when your medical officer tells you to. Now, in retrospect, this was probably appropriate, given how important uh, a threat of malaria was. Had we not been able to control the threat of malaria, we could have lost the South Pacific uh, campaign. In the aftermath of World War II, we gradually moved to use uh, chloroquine. being used so ubiquitously throughout the world, resistance developed to chloroquine. The malaria parasites found ways to overcome uh, chloroquine, and, and so there was a need to develop a new drug. We began to investigate uh, drugs closely related to those we had initially studied in World War II, the four methanol quinolines, or four quinoline methanols. And one candidate that emerged quickly uh, from this effort, uh, as early as 1969, was mefloquine. We should have known uh, during the early testing of mefloquine that the drug would have plausibly possessed similar properties to those that we saw with uh, adabrin or quinacrine. These tests continued through the 1980s and the military was very eager to see this drug uh, tested uh, in widespread use. In 2005, I took mefloquine. I was backpacking with some friends, and on the day that I took my fifth pill, something strange happened. I was in a cafe on the beach when, out of nowhere, I suddenly felt an overwhelming feeling of terror. Not knowing what to do, I ran outside. I looked around me and I had no idea who 
or where I was. At that stage, I didn't know how much worse the experience would get and for how long it would last. So we came back to the hostel and you were just, you were shaky, you weren't yourself. I just didn't think that there was a, it was an infection or it was malaria or something like that because of how unlike yourself you were. The days continued and you were just becoming increasingly isolated from the group and your behaviour was just becoming stranger and stranger. You'd shaved, you, you, wouldn't, you didn't wash, you were just in the same clothes. You were constantly paranoid and you gave an alias when you checked in <laughs> to the hostel. Um, you wrote somebody else's passport number and changed your name. You had lost grip of reality. And we actually had a conversation about whether or not we thought that you might try and kill yourself. Yeah, it was awful. It was awful. It took me the best part of two years to recover. But by 2015, other people's reactions to mefloquine were hitting the headlines all over the world. I was surprised that it had continued to be prescribed. Were people still really being affected? Maybe I, I can read something from the diary. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. And I start with, I have seen God. I know my purpose. I am the son of God. I'm here to make the world a better place. I can make my own religion. And you can be part of it. And then I say, what the fuck? A lot of uh, question marks. What the fuck? Am I supposed to see this? Well, it's happening. WTF, WTF, WTF. I began meeting people through online support groups, set up to bring those affected by mefloquine together. Every week, people from all over the world joined these groups, and Tim was one of them. Uh, last year, uh, the end of October, November, I went to Ghana. The Dutch system, they advised me about anti-malaria pills. And I thought, okay, I take Lariam, it's cheap, uh, one, one pill a week, no problems. And it wasn't like they, they made me aware that, that it's pretty, uh, that's a pretty big deal actually, Lariam. The first week was a total change for me. I had this feeling that I saw the light and I knew what I had to do with my life that I am some kind of messiah or... I was talking very high of myself uh, to my friends and they were like, yeah, what is he saying? So this the feeling of knowing everything gradually changed in chaos again, um, panicking and I wanted to express myself but no one was understanding me and I was thinking so fast, but the environment couldn't uh, react. I thought, maybe it's Larry Young. And when I look back at it, I was aware of my sickness, or how you call it. You're aware, but you can't, you can't do anything about it. You can't, I couldn't change the way I was perceiving reality. well known amongst kind of the expat community at the time that it was kind of the more dangerous drug. It hadn't, you know, not the slightest history of, of having, you know, issues to do with mental health. I remember having, I guess what we would call a panic attack, which I had never experienced before in my life. And then it kind of generated into this state of kind of non-stop crying, which then continued for about two days. And I, and I remember thinking I had no idea why I was so upset. I ended up staying at home for the majority of that spring. 
people when I when I told them what had been going on, almost everyone had known someone who had been affected by larium. That was the most surprising thing. These things, they came on at a very definite point in time, and it was when I took the, the larium. Losing weight, my mental emotional state was rapidly decreasing anxiety, panic attacks. It was like this, this rage, this, this anger. I didn't know who I was anymore because I was, I was just responding to my daily life in, in such a different way. Oh, I used to, I was so unbelievably social before, like, you know, I, I used to play music, I used to go out to music, go out dancing, you know, yeah, I was, I was into enjoying my life. Yeah, so I, uh, you know, have to enjoy walking to the letterbox now. <laughs> It seemed that in recent years, throughout the world, mefloquine was still being prescribed without much warning of its side effects, and some were still being seriously affected. So what about the situation in the UK? By 2015, the UK drug regulator had documented almost 7,000 reported adverse events, including 2,500 psychiatric disorders and 10 completed suicides. As a result, in 2013, the drugs manufacturer in the UK, Roche, stipulated that all health practitioners fully inform patients of potential side effects, assess their mental health background, and tell them what to do if they did experience a reaction. Back in 2005, I didn't receive anything like this degree of warning about the drug. If I had, I suspect I would have stayed well clear. But had things really changed? I went to find out. I tried to buy mefloquine from three major British high street pharmacies. Lloyd's was the only pharmacy of the three that I tried that told me I'd need a prescription and subsequently a consultation with my doctor before I could access mefloquine. So you would need um, a prescription from a doctor. So despite all the attention, the updated guidelines and the increased warnings, I could get hold of mefloquine pretty easily and little was done to make sure I knew about the serious risks. I wanted to know who was responsible for how it was prescribed. Roche, the manufacturer who sold the drug to huge clients in the UK, like the NHS and the Ministry of Defence, were surely the ones who knew the drug the best, and they provided instructions to doctors and patients. So were they responsible? Um, since 2013, the MHRA, uh, and working together with Roche, strengthened our label for Larium, and specifically calling out the neuropsychiatric events uh, and we believe it's very important that prescribers uh, and patients are made aware of that information from the outset so that they know how to respond should anybody be concerned that they might be having a change in their, their mental state uh, and importantly as well that, that people who have a reason not to pre prescribe larium shouldn't be given it. Roche told me that they were already aware that Boots was selling mefloquine without prescriptions or assessing people beforehand, and that they were looking into it. But what about Superdrug, another major British pharmacy chain that was doing the same? As you followed up with Boots, do you think you would also follow up with other chains such as Superdrug who were giving the drug out without prescription? So that's something that we're currently looking into to understand um, what the other routes are that are available via uh, a non-traditional way of prescribing, so it is something that we're looking into just now. I find this surprising. After years of media speculation about the side effects, numerous changes to the guidelines and warnings, and now a national inquiry, Roche were still looking into how the drug was given out. And I'd find that quite often in the UK, it was simply given out. 
So, who else was involved? It gets a little complicated. Aside from Roche, organisations like the MHRA and the World Health Organisation provide advice to patients and doctors and pass on adverse events reports to Public Health England's Advisory Committee on Malaria Prevention. And it's this committee's guidelines that appear to be the most influential in the whole process and directly influence practice at the NHS and the MOD. A member of the committee agreed to talk to me. I mean, each year in this country, we have over 1,600 cases of imported malaria in travellers, which uh, is fatal in about 10 to 12 people every year. Clearly, uh, a lot of people survive it, but they do so because we have effective drugs to treat it. But uh, to try and reduce that total, we would want people to take preventative tablets from malaria prophylaxis, which stops them getting the disease and any risk of dying. Um, if we look at the drug mefloquin, uh, people can have a neuropsychiatric reaction that occurs in about 1 in 10, 1 in 15,000 individuals. Um, in terms of that 1 in 10,000, is that from a particular study or is that from a... a these, are, these are from a number of studies that have put together that number. Um, these are epidemiologically based studies. They're not sort of, you know, I know three people who've had a reaction and therefore the risk is very high. And these are the ones that we tend to base our, our risk assessment on. Unlike the manufacturer and the American and European drug regulators, in recent years, the UK guidelines were unique and that they did not strengthen warnings about mefloquine psychiatric side effects or their potentially long-term nature. Definitely not swayed by public opinion. Um, and that's been a challenge because we have at occasional been under a lot of public pressure. But we would lose all credibility if we went against the scientific method for the, the media method. And, and, and that, would, that would be very damaging. In our scientific uh, review of what Mefquin does, we, at this moment in time, don't see a real need to make a change to the recommendations and the way it's used. Numerous scientific papers have been written about Mefquin side effects, but their findings on their strength and the likelihood of being affected were extremely varied. Although it was clear that mefloquine had emerged from a family of drugs that caused psychiatric disturbances in some, I couldn't find a definitive study that proved what caused these side effects and how common they were in users. However, I came to realise that there was one population of mefloquine users that could provide clearer and better documented data. So I began looking into what had been happening in the British Armed Forces. Two thousand and three. I was forty-eight then. Two thousand and three. Yes. Yeah. Malaria is probably most prevalent in in, in, in Sierra Leone. So quite clearly, we needed to have some uh, medical protection from it. I deployed to Freetown and I very quickly learned that the wider side effects that had been explained to me, like the dizziness, like the disturbed sleep, um, loss of memory and so on, seemed to be far more prevalent than, than I'd been expecting. Most members of the team preferred to throw away their larium rather than take it because of the range of side effects that they were suffering. They were having nightmares, dizziness, um, and particularly issues with, with anger management. 
it matched what we were being told were the side effects, but what was so surprising was that so many people were suffering from them. I had no idea, of course, then that um, not only was there a much broader range of side effects affecting more people, but actually those side effects in a number of instances were going to become chronic and life-threatening. For many years I worked in the army. I was 27 years in the army and for a long period of time I was the army's leading expert on malaria uh, and during that time I conducted research into mefloquine um, and uh, my position was that it was a dangerous drug and should not be given to soldiers and that is still my position now. I suspect some of the soldiers don't, don't take it but there will be soldiers who do take it and uh, there are soldiers and officers who have been badly damaged by taking methylquine um, long after it's been known by the Ministry of Defence that it's a dangerous drug that should not be prescribed routinely. As long as ago as 1989, the World Health Organisation reported that methylquine can cause severe mental disturbances and that the reported side effects were a cause for concern. Uh, these people have suffered uh, the most terrible side effects and ill health after taking this drug, which they took in all good faith and on the basis of advice, sometimes for a very long time. Many of them are young, high-achieving people who feel that their lives have been destroyed. I did quite a lot of research and then was lucky enough to get a debate in the House of Commons in March 1997. Since then, on and off, have had emails from people well, all over the world really, saying that I've seen your speech and I, you know, it has either affected or destroyed my life. Getting on for 20 years later, um, still finding that there are people whose lives have been, you know, if not devastated, then materially affected by the, this drug. One man said that he'd come back from um, a tour of duty and his wife had had a baby and he was terrified to pick up the baby. He thought he might harm it. I'm st staggered that people who are serving now have been given larium. I submitted a Freedom of Information request to find out how many people in the military had been prescribed mefloquine, and if there had been any noticeable impact of the much discussed side effects. When I received the response, I was intrigued. Since 2010, 13,000 regular armed forces personnel have been prescribed mefloquine. For the same period and from the same group, 921 of those who had taken mefloquine had subsequently received care for a mental health disorder. That's a rate of 7%. I then found that the average rate for mental health diagnosis amongst all armed forces personnel was surprisingly low, 2.3%. For those returning from conflict zones, mainly Afghanistan, the figure was marginally higher, 2.46%. So those who had taken mefloquine were significantly more likely to be diagnosed with mental health disorders than the military in general and those returning from conflict areas. What was even more surprising was that far more UK personnel who had been prescribed mefloquine had been deployed to Africa than to Iraq or Afghanistan. And British military are most often deployed to African countries on training exercises, which, on paper at least, would subject armed forces to less traumatic experiences. I asked the Ministry of Defence for a response to my findings. They told me they weren't able to give me an interview, but they did issue me with a statement, including the following. The 7% referral rate to Department for Community Mental Health mentioned, we believe relates to all anti-malarial use, not just mefloquine. However, when I asked them to provide me with data detailing the rates of mental health disorder diagnosis as a result of other anti-malarial use, they told me the data was not publicly available. 
since 2013, I've interviewed senior officers, both on the record and off the record. I've heard stories of Royal Navy rating who, having taken Larium in Sierra Leone, was literally too frightened to go on duty armed in case he did something with his weapon. Now that's telling me that, you know, alarm bells ring when someone tells me this. This was a subject which I couldn't quite understand. Was it about money? Was it about the ease of taking this tablet? Why is it that after all this evidence, the MOD was still pressing ahead? I started raising freedom of information um, requests with the Ministry of Defence to try to find out what they knew about Larium. And in amongst those various papers, um, I got a statement from the Ministry of Defence saying the Secretary of State accepted that I had this condition and that it was caused by my service use of, of Larium. The Ministry of Defence has recognised this and it is, and it is recorded, um, but there is an extraordinary, extraordinary lack of curiosity, to put it really very mildly, amongst the Surgeon General and his department as to what is causing this problem. The MOD responded with an interesting statement. Interesting for two reasons. First, it stated that mefloquine was rarely prescribed and that it was only given to a tiny percentage of armed forces. But between 2007 and 2014, almost 170,000 individual armed forces personnel were deployed overseas. And for the same period, 16,000 personnel were prescribed mefloquine. That works out as almost 10%, which doesn't seem all that tiny. The Ministry of Defence were appearing defensive. Secondly, the statement claimed that mefloquine was taken safely and that since 2013, every soldier was given a full mental health risk assessment prior to prescribing. But I had been in contact with serving members of the armed forces who wanted to remain anonymous. And they told me that as recently as 2014, Mefilcon had been given out without any risk assessment or much choice. Sometimes simply handed it in the corridor. I was deployed on a training exercise in 2014. We were told to start taking Mefilcon a month before we went. We simply went down to the medics and they distributed boxes amongst us. Each man got two boxes, I think. It was just dished out. One of the quite shocking things that I found was that people were quite literally reporting having been given the larium with their tropical kit. So they would be given their socks and their shirt, their sunblock, their deodorant probably, for, for, for all I know, and their larium. From a legal point of view, there is no, there's no option about this you should be allowed to say, I don't want that, I want an alternative. Now it seems to me pretty outrageous that the people who protect us are not given any sort of choice along those lines. If you don't do that, you're failing in your legal duty of care. For a drug that was available so widely to the public, the mefloquine story in the UK appeared very closely linked with its use in the military. And I had now found that soldiers were more likely to experience mental health problems while taking it. This was particularly surprising when I learned what had already taken place further afield. late 2006, early 2007, I deployed with the 82nd Airborne Division to Afghanistan. And it was during my deployment to Afghanistan that I quickly recognized that many of the policies that we had in place for dealing with malaria, particularly our policies for use of mefloquine, were not being complied with and that there were many problems 
with our use of the drug. And it was around this time, our use of uh, mefloquine in Afghanistan and then our use of mefloquine on a large scale in Iraq, that public concern began to be focused uh, at our use of the drug. There were a, a number of disturbing reports of homicide and suicide, domestic cases associated with soldiers returning home who had taken the mefloquine. And this led to large-scale media attention and also to congressional concern with the drug. Mefloquine causes a severe intoxication syndrome characterized by vivid nightmares, profound anxiety, aggression, delusional paranoia, dissociative psychosis, and severe memory loss. My recent research has helped us understand this syndrome as a toxic encephalopathy that affects the limbic portion of the brain. With this insight, we now understand the drug's strong links to suicide and to acts of seemingly senseless and impulsive violence. There have been a number of cases where behavior uh, due to mefloquine may have played a plausible role, uh, but this was not raised at trial. There was one case amongst these that has received more attention than any other. A Freedom of Information request reveals that on the 29th of March 2012, an adverse event report was issued to mefloquine's manufacturer, Roche. Seemingly submitted by a pharmacist, it describes how a soldier in the US Army who was taking mefloquine had killed 17 Afghanis. It is unclear where the actual report was originated and the soldier is not specifically named. However, only one event near the time of the report fits the description. On the 11th of March 2012, two weeks before the adverse event report was filed, Sergeant Robert Bales left his camp in southern Afghanistan in the middle of the night and shot dead 16 unarmed Afghani villagers in their homes. Bales, who had previously sustained a brain injury, pled guilty in court and stated that he had no explanation for what he had done. Bales' lawyers had initially planned to argue that he was insane at the time of the massacre, but the Los Angeles Times says such cases are hard to prove. Still, the defense says Bales' mental problems should rule out the death penalty. since been revealed that Bales took mefloquine on a previous deployment. However, it is still unknown whether he had been taking mefloquine in 2012. Bales' toxicology report from the time of the murders remains classified. Speculation about whether or not Bales was taking mefloquine continues. The case attracted significant media attention and raised questions about how mefloquine was prescribed in the US military. Now, whether or not Bales took this drug, we do not know, the Pentagon will not say. If he took the drug, could it have led to, the, to this kind of psychotic behavior? Definitely, it says that on the drug label and we've seen it time and time again. The following year, the US Army officially downgraded mefloquine to a drug of last resort, only to be used when all other options were unavailable. In 2009, I was stationed in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba with the 629th Military Intelligence Battalion. And 
we started looking at uh, over 3,000 FOIA documents. I found that all three of them received a drug called methylquin. They received the drug on their first, within 24 hours after their arrival in the Guantanamo. They, they had the dosage in the autopsy reports of how much methylquin they received when they initially arrived in Guantanamo. These guys were getting five times the dosage of what any normal human being was supposed to receive, so I knew it was something very suspicious about this. They made the odd argument that this was for the benefit of residents of Cuba, but methylquin has no effect on the form of the malaria parasite that actually transmits disease. So if a detainee were given methylquin and a mosquito were to bite the detainee, that stage of the parasite that transmits disease would still be alive and would not be affected by methylquin. It's possible that the use of methylquin at Guantanamo was simply erroneously directed by individuals who lacked training or familiarity who were not familiar with best practices. The other possibility, which is clearly deeply troubling to consider, could we have been using mefloquine to increase the types of uh, symptoms, the discomfort uh, that uh, the detainees were experiencing for the aid of uh, enhancing interrogation. Given that many of the forms of uh, torture we employed resulted in many of the same effects. The American Department of Defense bases its medical policies on recommendations from the Center for Disease Control. In 2004, the CDC recommended that mefloquine should only be used when no other treatment options are available. The two treatment options that they did recommend were readily available. And the guidelines note that mefloquine is associated with a higher rate of neuropsychiatric reactions when used at treatment doses. I had found that the practice of administering high doses of mefloquine to detainees on arrival continued until at least summer 2005, a whole year after these guidelines were published. No one at Guantanamo was ever given this drug except the detainees themselves. When you question the DOD about who came up with the policy of mefloquine in Guantanamo, they won't tell anyone who came up with that policy. No one knows where, where it came from. I now knew that the American military had not only known about the risks methyl composed to troops, but, more worryingly, had possibly even utilised the adverse effects. The Brits were also well aware of the side effects. But while the Americans had all but banned the drug, the British armed forces continued to administer it, despite the seemingly high rate of reactions. I asked the MOD again for an interview, and this time they agreed. They arranged for me to meet with a representative. First World War, malaria was a massive disease, uh, and we forget these days how important it was to military forces. So, for example, there, there was a campaign in Eastern Europe, uh, the, the old Eastern Front, uh, Salonika. Uh, from malaria alone, there were 146,000 people evacuated to the UK just from malaria as a disease. So, this, this was a massive impact on British military forces at that time. World War II, uh, again, malaria caused huge operational impact throughout you know, the, the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, the US Marine Corps had massive problems um, throughout uh, their campaign of fighting their way through, through the Philippines and the Solomon Islands. Malaria has continued to pose uh, a threat to British troops wherever they deploy in the world. 
Um, we don't choose to go to rich five-star resorts. In general, we tend to fight wars in strange foreign places with strange foreign diseases. Uh, and, and that's the nature of, of what we do these days. The odd thing at that time was that you know, because the drug wasn't being used in the UK, we, we had uh, legions of people banging on our doors saying, let me use this drug. You know, we were at a, a time when there was very little uh, drug therapy or, or prevention available for malaria. Uh, and it's clearly attractive to a lot of people uh, just to take you know, one tablet once a week. The British military had always been clear that mefloquine's weekly dosage and its potency made it an extremely practical defence against malaria. Mefloquine has been, and continues to be, an attractive tool for the armed forces, despite the potential for serious psychological side effects. So what did Group Captain Green think about the documented risks? He also, along with Dr Behrens, happened to be a member of Public Health England's Advisory Committee on Malaria Prevention. The committee's influential guidelines maintain that mefloquine is an important prophylactic, tolerated by the majority of travellers. The, the reason you know, why you know, has this data you know, not, not proven anything, well, it, it suggests that, that you know, whilst um, adverse effects may exist, uh, they're, they're certainly not uh, of a level that are easily measured uh, and, and uh, of an extent or, or indeed uh, severity uh, and, and you know, very common to, 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 to stop people uh, advising the drug. Of course, Public Health England will continue to say that because that's what they've always said and they don't want to, to backtrack now. So. Essentially, one government department's backing up another government department, and it's a sort of cycle of, shall we say, denial that they just can't break out of, and it requires something catastrophic to really break that logjam. People are protecting their own reputations and vested interest within a very closed clique or cohort of people who are responsible for the administration of the drug. The UK guidelines still seemed at odds with much of what I'd heard. I decided to look one last time at the studies. The first study where nefloquine was looked at in travellers in a randomised control uh, trial didn't take place until 2001, or wasn't, wasn't reported until 2001, which was a good 10 or 15 years after it had been widely used by many travellers in many countries. Importantly, this study in 2001 was the first to test mefloquine with the representative population where participants didn't know which drug they were taking. It's one of only a few studies that have tested mefloquine using this rigorous method. These studies have given mixed results, but have all found mefloquine to cause moderate to severe neuropsychiatric side effects in a sizable portion of users from 14 to 37%. This contradicts a much-referenced major study by the US military, which looked at thousands of hospital records. It found that the percentage of mefloquine users hospitalised with a mental health disorder was negligible. However, not many of the people who I had met who'd suffered from the effects of mefloquine had been admitted to hospital. In fact, for some that I talked to, it had taken years, even decades, to even discover that mefloquine may have been the cause of their mental health disorders. What no study has managed to determine is how long sufferers are likely to be affected. I too still have my bad days, sometimes weeks, when those early experiences haunted me. 
And the truth was that, despite countless studies and theories, more was still unknown than known about how mefloquine affected the brain. And by 2015, people wanted answers more than ever. So, could there be a connection between the increase in suicides among Irish soldiers and larium? Tonight, in her special report... The report Rita showed that mefloquine, an anti-malaria drug that was taken by Canadian soldiers in the 1990s, actually was having some very bad permanent side effects. That had All former goes. soldiers are and coming forward with accounts of mental health problems linked to an anti-malaria drug they were forced to take for the deployment to East Timor. The defence bureaucracy... Around the world, people were coming forward to talk about how mefloquine had affected them. Some had even begun to take legal action. But in May 2016, the spotlight fell upon the British Parliament. Over six months, the Parliamentary Defence Committee had heard evidence from the drugs manufacturer, specialists and leading figures from the Ministry of Defence, with often heated results. It would seem that the MOD are quite happy to ride roughshod over employees Lies and just say, well, that doesn't who, who feel, you know, they, did, they don't come and talk to us about anything else. They come and talk to us about Larry. And, and does that not mean we should be asking so these no, questions? I wouldn't agree should that we, we move to a position to... simply uh, not to prescribe any drug that requires a risk, a risk assessment because I can't guarantee you 100% of the time uh, that that process is being carried out. Accompanied by a media storm, the committee's report concluded the prescribing of mefloquine over a number of years had demonstrated a lamentable weakness in the MOD's duty of care. Furthermore, it stated its belief that mefloquine should now only be used as a drug of last resort. Then finally, the government spoke out. In an official response, they acknowledged that changes needed to be made. Face-to-face -face risk assessments prior to prescribing would now be mandatory, and alternative drugs would be offered to troops. However, the government maintained that mefloquine remained an appropriate drug for those willing to take it, and, crucially, rejected the proposal of designating mefloquine a drug of last resort. The government's response was, in my opinion, written in a very evasive manner. Uh, other countries uh, haven't had a problem conceding that uh, the risks of valerium uh, are so great in comparison to its benefits that it really should only be used uh, as a drug of last resort, if at all. So why the UK did not uh, similarly come to that conclusion is... is uh, of some interest, and I suspect that uh, there are some legal reasons for this. Dr. Nevin had sent me through some policy documents he had obtained. They had been published a month prior to the inquiry report, and they had some noticeable changes from earlier versions. Okay, okay. so even though the government has refused to to classify mefloquine as a drug of last resort, the changes to the MOD policy documents, which you've seen pretty much make it so that it is. The document now uh, prescribes that larium or mefloquine be used only as a drug of last resort and only when the two safer uh, daily uh, medications uh, have been ruled out for use because of intolerance or allergies. Given the current uh, context and the number of legal claims that uh, the Ministry of Defense is facing, that uh, making that concession now, so late in the process, and after having defended uh, Larium for so long, I, I think would have been seen uh, as exposing them to too much legal risk. Thank Take you. care. Oh, bye bye. So at the moment we're dealing with well over 500 people who've come to us and said that they feel that they were uh, harmed. 
So what I'm going to invite the Ministry of Defence to do is agree a process which will make uh, the, the claims as smooth as possible for our clients by minimising the areas of disagreement. <laughs> Whilst making the film, I had come to terms with the source of my own mental breakdown. But whilst I'd been able to seek help and in many ways leave Mefloquim behind, for others, the adverse events ran much deeper. Today, retired and serving military personnel and civilians are taking the first steps in their negligence legal battles. And for the rest of the sufferers, the daily battles continue. I've been in routinely stressful situations in Northern Ireland, in the Balkans, um, in the Middle East. Um, I, I know what stressful situations are, but nothing like the effects that have been caused by larian toxicity. It was really a relief to know that other people it's scary that other people had the same things as I had. But it's also like, okay, this, maybe it's just medicine that did that to me. Yeah, for me, it's not really an option to, to put it all behind me and not think about it because it definitely has an impact on my life as a person. Because I think you have to express what, you're, what you've been through Otherwise, it's very difficult to, yeah, to live with it.